So I want to look at the profits in some somewhat of a summary format is insofar as I think we will cover a lot of verses very quickly and then uh, move on to Jesus's teaching of the Good Shepherd in John. But I want to start in the consequences that are found in the prophets. Isaiah and Jeremiah both have some passages regarding this. And there are consequences when the elders are not doing what they should do and they're not being what they should be. There are things that happen. One thing that Isaiah 56, end of that chapter, leading into the first verse of 57, shows us is that the righteous perish mysteriously. When elders are not what they're supposed to be, when they're not doing their jobs, those who are right, those who are good, they die. And nobody knows why. They just drop off and drop out. Isaiah 56.10 begins, His watchmen are blind. They're all without knowledge. They're silent dogs. They cannot bark. Dreaming, lying down, loving to slumber. Oh, they have a mighty appetite. They never have enough. But they're shepherds who have no understanding. They've all turned their own way, each to his own gain. One and all. And the first verse of the next chapter, the righteous man perishes and no one lays it to heart. Devout men are taken away while no one understands. See, this is what happens when nobody's watching. That's the idea. When nobody is watching, that's what happens. The watchmen are not supposed to be blind. We get mad at the refs for being blind. Well, the watchmen are not supposed to be blind either. <laughs> The watchmen are supposed to be dogs that are useful dogs, that is, dogs that bark in the sense of guard dogs. You're talking about watchers, guard dogs here. If a guard dog has no bark, well, what use is it? <laughs> it's not a good thing. You need them to be able to draw attention to things. You need the, the, the refs to be able to see, right? And, um, as we say, the result of this problem is the righteous man perishes and nobody lays it to heart. And yet nobody notices, nobody cares is what happens. Devout are taken away. No one understands why. It just happens. That's what it looks like when you don't have faithful elders, when nobody is watching, when nobody is warning. When nobody is aware of error, or what error is, or who is teaching it, when um, people come and want to be a part of the congregation, but actually they don't serve God, they serve selves, or they serve some falsehood, and nobody bothers to find out, nobody knows how to find out, and they come in, then yes, the righteous die, people die, because no one's watching, nobody's aware, nobody's protecting the perimeter. The other thing that happens, or another thing that happens, is that our children are no more. In Jeremiah 10, the Lord said, My tent is destroyed, beginning at verse 20. All my cords are broken. My children have gone from me, and they are no more. They are not. There's no one to spread my tent again and to set up my curtains, because the shepherds are stupid and do not inquire of the Lord. Therefore they have not prospered, and all their flock is scattered. Therefore, it is really Hebrew for that's why. The shepherds are stupid and do not inquire of the Lord. That's why they have not prospered and their flock is scattered. And this is the question, you know, for all of us. Do your kids need other kids? Or do they need the truth? Which one is it? Well, it's the truth. They need, yeah, they do need other kids. We all need friends. But your best friend is Jesus. You have to have the truth. You can't compromise truth. You can make friends in the world who are not Christians. You can't find truth anywhere else. And as he said here, the shepherds are stupid if they don't inquire of the Lord. If they're not asking God, if they're not looking for, thus saith the Lord, for what they are saying and doing and joining upon the congregation, they're not doing this right, and it leads to the destruction of our children. The flock is scattered because of this. 
Also in Jeremiah, in a couple of chapters down at verse 12, in the end, what will happen is we'll be forsaken by God because we have forsaken him. If the shepherds are not what they're supposed to be, if they're not doing the job they're supposed to be doing, then God will forsake us when we forsake him. That's Jeremiah 12. Begin uh, there at verse 7, I've forsaken my house and abandoned my heritage. Why is this? Well, the 10th verse tells you, many shepherds have destroyed my vineyard. They've trampled down my portion. They've made my pleasant portion a desolate a desolate wilderness. They made it a desolation. And it, being desolate, mourns to me. The whole land is made desolate, but no man lays it to heart. Remember what we read over there in Isaiah 57.1? Upon all the bare heights in the desert, destroyers have come. The sword of the Lord devours, because from one end of the land to the other, no flesh has peace. Nobody in that congregation will be at peace. You see? They've sown wheat and reaped thorns. They've tired themselves out, but profit nothing. They'll be ashamed of their harvest because of the fierce anger of the Lord. Nothing we undertake to do will succeed if we don't care about God's things to begin with. And this bit in the 12th verse about many shepherds have destroyed my vineyard and trampled down my portion. It means they're trying all kinds of different things, all kinds of different ways and approaches to doing things. But they're missing the one that is necessary. Oops. Yes, the reason that our harvest, that is what we try to do, is going to produce problems is because the Lord is angry with us for not doing his things in his ways. So those are some consequences. As for the shepherds themselves, we should say this, you know, um, shepherds need to understand that there are consequences, that it's a serious matter serving God, and that being an elder is a responsibility, it's a weighty responsibility, and you got to think about this. Two passages, I think they're very important. Jeremiah 23, uh, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. So this is a woe pronounced on those who are supposed to be the leaders, the shepherds. In fact, they're destroying and scattering. Jeremiah 23, verse 2 continues, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, You have scattered my flock. You have driven them away. You have not attended to them either. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds. I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I've driven them. I'll bring them back to their fold. They'll be fruitful and multiply. And the fourth verse, very importantly, says, I will set shepherds over them who will care for them. They will fear no more, nor be dismayed. Neither shall any be missing, declares the Lord. Look at what happens when you have shepherds that are actually caring. When the elders are doing what they're supposed to be doing, the people fear no more. The people are not dismayed. None of them go missing. Because somebody watches, somebody protects, somebody chases after and comes, brings back. In Zechariah 10, should we pronounce that? Zachariah, I think we, or maybe even just Zachary, I think that would be good, right? I, th I see one vote for that. Um, Zechariah 10, there are consequences for elders here. Notice, again, it has to do with your source. What is your source of authority? We, we spent a good bit of time in Titus 1 9 saying that the, the source is the Bible, he is dedicated to the Word of the faith. Zechariah 10.2, the household gods utter nonsense. The diviners see lies. They tell false dreams and give empty consolation. That's why the people wander like sheep. They're afflicted for lack of a shepherd. 
And it's not that they didn't have people who were serving as shepherds. They did. There in verse 3. My anger is hot against the shepherds. I will punish the leaders. You know, it says God will punish the leaders. I think this is an important thing. You look at various places where uh, those who were in charge did not do what they were supposed to do. There are many examples of those who did what was right. But there are also examples of those who did what was wrong. And, and you see for, you know, you think perhaps um, uh, of the, the sons of Aaron doing evil. That's true, they did. And they were removed kind of quickly, actually. Um, Eli, the high priest, in the time that Samuel was born, um, was not doing right. He did not restrain his sons. And his sons were doing some very horrible things in the worship of God for many years. Well, God destroyed that whole household, but not the next day. There is such a thing as wait on the Lord. Um, it is the case that sometimes people who have been given authority don't use it appropriately and do evil with it. That doesn't mean that we do away with that office or refuse to fill it. It just means that we may have to wait on the Lord. Sometimes people who are leaders are not doing what they should do. Now there are things there, as we've read before in 1 Timothy 5, there are things, say the, the evangelist is to rebuke elders who are in sin. There are many things of this nature that um, are laid out for us in, in the scriptures. But in the end, if you have an evangelist who won't rebuke them or, or actually goes along with what they're doing, and what they're doing is a sinful thing, there's relatively little that can be done about that situation. You basically have to leave. If you're going to be uh, insistent that nah, that's not even workable, there's no way to serve God in this place, well then you're going to have to leave because there's not an appropriate way to insert yourself into that situation when God has placed an authority. The Lord will rebuke them the Lord's word rebukes them. Anyone who is faithful in holding the Lord's word can use that word to rebuke them. And hopefully they'll repent and do right, but they may not. And you may have to walk away from that. You may have to wait on the Lord, though, if you don't have a choice, if you live there, if you're stuck. But don't, you know, as we say, woe to that shepherd, though, because the Lord of hosts cares for his flock, the house of Judah, From the Lord of hosts will come the cornerstone, the tent peg, the battle bow, and from him every ruler, all of them together. Which is very much what we read in Acts 20, verse 28, where Paul said, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. When we appoint leaders the way that God says to do so in the scriptures, we get the leaders that God wants us to have. And so this is the idea. It should be this way rather than what you see happening. And yet, even here in Zechariah 10, it's God who's going to remove them. That's not you and me taking matters into our own hands. Especially dire, though, I think is Zechariah eleven seventeen. He said there, in just one verse, I think something that every elder should take to heart, Woe to a, my worthless shepherd who deserts the flock. May the sword strike his arm and his right eye. Let his arm be wholly withered, his right eye utterly blinded. Uh, that is what the Lord says. If you're going to take on the mantle of responsibility, if you're going to be um, a leader among God's people, you need to be faithful. You don't desert the flock in their time of need. When the wolf shows up, you don't run and hide. You are the one who stands up and fights. When there's error being brought into the church or trying to get into the church, when there's error being taught, you are supposed to stand up in front and deal with that problem. Protect the young, protect the innocent, protect the new convert, protect those who don't know the scriptures as well as they should. That's all part of your job as an elder. And if that kind of thing raises its ugly head and you run, woe to you. As God said, may the sword strike his arm in his right eye. Well, the arm is your strength, you know. But it's very similar, I think, to the curse in Matthew 5, 
29 and 30. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. Right? Better to enter life maimed than to go into hell whole. That's the curse. And I think that that's a very serious thing that we should not get caught up in that. If you're going to be a leader, you need to lead. Otherwise, why did God give you strength? Why did God give you vision? Why were you put into that position? Which is pretty harsh, but I think it's an important thing to understand that God takes it very seriously. All right, so now we go on to John, where Jesus is the good shepherd. And the reason for leaving this to last, even though it seems like it's the, it's the nice passage, you know, <laughs> this is the one you can teach in the children's Bible class. Yes, I know, but they don't understand it. Half of us don't understand it. <laughs> That's all right. Jesus, the good shepherd, um, requires that we, uh, that we understand the things that we've just read not just in this particular lesson, but in, you know, leading up to this, all the things we've seen in the prophets about the shepherds of Israel, both the good and the bad, it requires you to have that background to understand what Jesus is saying. That's why we left it until now. But now we're here. John 9, beginning at 39. You may recall that Jesus healed a man who had been born blind. And when he did this, the rulers of the people disapproved. They did not approve of this healing for various and sundry reasons, none of them correct. And they really put that man through the ringer. In fact, that man was ejected from the synagogue. And the Lord came to him and he believed in the Lord. And he says the following things, which starts here but goes into chapter 10. And when he does this, he does it in earshot of the leaders who just ejected him. Jesus is doing this on purpose. For judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see and those who see may become blind. That's why he healed the blind man. <laughs> the whole purpose of this is to drive, down, drive that point home. I came into this world for judgment. It is being judged. They are supposed to be the shepherds of Israel, but they disapprove of the work of the Son of God. That tells you they are failing the judgment. They are not passing the judgment. So some of those Pharisees nearby heard him say this and said, Are we blind too? You hear what that means? <laughs> that means not us though, right? Jesus said, If you were blind, you'd have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. Truly I tell you, he who doesn't enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by some other way, that man is a thief and a robber. Who is he talking about? <laughs> right. He's talking about you, Pharisees. That's what he's doing. I came for judgment. If you were innocent, if you were blind, you could be forgiven, but since you say we see, your guilt remains. He who doesn't enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in in some other way, that man's a thief and a robber. Meaning, you did not come in to this honestly. You did not come into this in the straightforward, simple, biblical way. What are your intentions if you're not coming through the door? Why would you enter the sheepfold? through some other method. Well, I'm just non-traditional. No, that's not the point. 
the point is, <laughs> why can't you come through the door? Well, there might be reasons for that, which he covers. He who enters by the door is the shepherd. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name. He knows them and leads them out. And when he's brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they'll not follow. They'll flee from that one because they don't know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they didn't understand what he was saying. <laughs> so he starts again at verse 7, and we'll get there. But first, let's look back at this figure of speech. What's the most straightforward entrance that there is? Well, it's the door of the sheepfold. The door or the gate of the corral, if you like, if you want to go southwestern. <laughs> the gate of the corral, how about that? Why would you enter by some way that is other than the gate? This is the most straightforward entrance. That's the way you go in. When you are the person who is building the corral, when you're the person whose house is on that property, whose fields are on that property, and, and you're, you're putting a corral in place, you put the door where it makes the most sense. That's how it is. When somebody is coming into the corral and it's not through the door, they are coming from some other direction that does not make sense. That's what this means. They're doing something. Their intention is not good. Why would they come through some means that is not the door? Well, the, sh the, uh, the shepherd has the gatekeeper open to him. The gatekeeper recognizes him. He, he authenticates. <laughs> he passes inspection. He can come. The other person comes not through the door because he can't get in the door. He's not allowed in here. If he were straightforward about what he's really trying to do, he wouldn't be allowed in. Well, you have no business in this corral. You don't work here. You're not the owner of these animals. The sheep hear his voice. He calls his own by name and leads them out. The sheep hear his voice. They know what he sounds like, even sheep. I don't know sheep very well. I know a little bit about cattle. Not very well, but I know some. Um, I remember well joining my, I guess we call it great uncle in English, right? My dad's uncle. That's great uncle, right? That doesn't make any sense, but whatever. Why is that not grand uncle? I don't get it. Anyway, um, I remember, you know, he had the corral there, the, uh, the, the, the cattle were in there. I had uh, I was helping him do something and he decided it was time to feed the cattle so he went and, um, and, and he had the he had the food with him but I needed to get I think I needed to get some water for something we were doing there and the only place that I could think of where there was a bucket was back there by the by the food and I went and grabbed the bucket and I was walking back while he's coming around the other side with the real food and I looked over and you know every single cow in that whole corral is looking at me <laughs> just watching me as I walk across with the bucket and uh, I don't know why who knows why I decided that I would talk to them and I said <laughs> I said to them why are you looking at me he's got the food and as soon as I said, he's got the food, and I pointed that way, every cow in the whole corral went, <laughs> every one of them. I'm not kidding. I don't know why. I have no, it's just something about being Samora. I, I don't know. We're just, that's what we do. And uh, 
I realized like, yeah, they know exactly how to follow the, the movement, the language. They know what he, the humans who actually care and who are concerned, they can follow that. They understand that. That was the thing. I was shocked when, I don't know why I decided to talk to them. I have no idea. And I was even, when I shocked, when I realized, oh, that worked too. Why did they understand me? Why did I try to talk to them? What is going on here? And I don't know, but it was true. And I realized they do hear his voice. They do follow him. They know who cares. It was reasonable for them to suppose that I had food because I had taken the bucket from the food area. But it was weird that they understood. I was telling them I did not have it. He had it. <laughs> that was very strange. But they did. So the point of this is that if what we're saying is Moses is the gatekeeper, if you know Moses, if you know the law, if you know the teaching, the patterns of scripture about how God is going to save them, then when Jesus comes, you recognize him. That's the meaning of this. Moses is the gatekeeper. To Jesus, Moses opens, and the sheep hear that, and then he calls his own sheep and leads them, and when he's brought out his own, he goes before them, meaning there might be multiple different animals in here, that's what a corral is about, right? You don't want all of them, you want to control which ones you're trying to get out. So he's controlling this. He has called his own. They, his own know him and respond and they come back and they come. When he has brought them out, he walks in front of them and they follow him. And that's also true. My great uncle would walk and over to the, over to the, you, you think this corral is here because you're trying to keep them contained. Not really. It's for sorting. So he would just walk to the pasture and they would follow him and it was fine <laughs> and he would open the gate and they would walk in there and he would close the gate and the sheep follow him because they know his voice they know who this is the reason that Jesus is well received is that the people of God recognize God God's word in him that's what's happening a stranger though they don't follow They'll flee from that one because they don't know the voice of strangers. Also true. They're concerned about humans they do not know. Why are you trying to get in here? The reason the Pharisees have so much opposition then is that the people of God see they are not ha handling the scriptures rightly. So the elders are going to be faithful. Right? If, if, then, then their behavior and their teaching and, and the way they conduct themselves as elders should be found in the scriptures. And when the people see that, they'll recognize it. And if the elders are not faithful, and if they are not willing to uphold the word, the people should see that too, and they should be very concerned. So that's what he means by this. And they didn't get it. So he starts again, this time a little bit more plainly, saying at verse 7, Truly I tell you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. He's saying, this is why you guys had no audience with the blind man. He did not listen to you. The people are not listening to you because you are thieves and robbers. You did not come through the front door. You did not follow the pattern of scripture. You are not here for good reasons. If you were, you'd be able to follow the protocol and get in the front door, but you're not. I'm the door. If anyone enters by me, he'll be saved and go in and out and find pasture. But the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. <clears throat> I came that they may have life abundantly. The thief only comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. It's just not useful. They're, they're there, you know, in the office, so leading among the people, but only so that they can have their own following their own people who agree with them and pat their back, their back to steal and to kill and to destroy. In the end, 
They're trying to turn it into something that is not right. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd, not the bad one. They've had enough bad shepherds. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who's a hired hand, not a shepherd, who doesn't own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. And sometimes people will, will use this and say, well, this is why you don't pay gospel preachers. That's not really what he's talking about. Um, paying them is commanded in 1 Corinthians 9. And they're not elders. They're evangelists. That's different. <laughs> Although paying, uh, paying, paying elders is also part of the scriptures there. But um, no, the point of this is that the person who has been hired and is just working there doesn't have the same dedication as the person who owns these animals, who loves them and cares for them and lays down his life for them, verse 11. The hired hand doesn't own them. When the wolf is coming, it's not worth the pay to take his life into his own hands. So he runs. And that's the one we were reading about in Zechariah 11. Woe to that shepherd. But that's not Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own. My own know me. As the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them too. They will listen to my voice. There will be one flock, one shepherd. John 10, 6. And no, sorry friends, it is not Mormonism. That's not what this means. This is Jew and Gentile. The Gentiles are the other sheep that will be brought into this flock, which happened very quickly. Acts 10 at the latest, if you want to argue that way. Although Paul began to preach among the nations fairly quickly from Acts 9. But one flock, one shepherd actually comes from another place, which is the last place we'll go to, and it is Ezekiel 34. But before we head over there, just remember, Jesus is the good shepherd, the real thing, the real deal. He is authenticated by the word that supports him, his, the pattern of his life in Scripture. One flock and one shepherd comes from Ezekiel 34. Now, this is an interesting passage because here there is a condemnation of the evil shepherds in Israel, which we read uh, this morning, actually. <clears throat> but in this particular set of verses, which is uh, 20 to 24, he speaks about judging between sheep and sheep. It's one thing to judge the shepherds of the sheep, the leaders, now this is about sheep and sheep. How does a flock conduct itself? Shepherd or no? The Lord said, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you push with side and shoulder and thrust at all the wheat with your horns till you've scattered them abroad, I will rescue my flock and they'll no longer be a prey. I will judge between sheep and sheep. God is going to judge how we behave ourselves, even in the absence of elders. Notice in 21, he said, you push with the side and the shoulder, meaning the big ones, the mean ones, and thrust at all the weak with your horns till you've scattered them abroad. It's true, sometimes the larger animals get mean and they get too big for their riches and they are pushy and they are taking uh, charge and they are taking control by force especially when nobody is there to stop them to correct them to corral them the lord said i will rescue my flock they won't be a prey i will judge between sheep and sheep i will set up over them one shepherd my servant david and he will feed them he'll feed them and be their shepherd 
my servant David. He says, through Ezekiel, centuries after the King David has passed away. Clearly we mean the kingdom, uh, the, the, the throne of David, the kingdom, the descendant of David. It's Jesus, is it not? I, the Lord, will be their God. My servant David will be prince among them. I'm the Lord, I've spoken. What does this mean? Well, it means that, you know, when Jesus uses the same words that Ezekiel used, he is referring the shepherds of Israel to Ezekiel. He's referring them to the prophets to have a look there and see what is written and consider their own service before God, whether they have done right or not. And this is what it means. Jesus is referring the Pharisees out to the prophets. They should look and see whether they are there. But he said, I am bringing them together. There is one flock, there is one shepherd. It's a very clear reference here. In Ezekiel 34, 23, I will set up over them one shepherd, David. And you know, there's more than one line of kings. But David is the one that unites them. So they become one flock under David, even though there is an Israelite line of kings. <clears throat> so there's plenty of scriptural precedents for that idea that they're going to be united under one. When Jesus said what he did about um, one flock, one shepherd. But these are those who hear him, as opposed to the sheep who have fighting amongst themselves, where the mean ones, the strong ones, are, get pushy and get their own way. Take advantage of those who are weak, who do not know better, or don't, do not know more, or are not willing to stand up for themselves. That's not the way God's church is supposed to be. So Jesus is the good shepherd. He judges between the sheep. He brings his, his uh, real shepherding to us that we might be blessed. Well, let's go back to the beginning, remind ourselves of Acts 20, 28. They are to pay attention to themselves <clears throat> carefully and attention to the flock. They have been appointed by God, by the Holy Spirit, as overseers, because they were appointed according to the instructions of 1 Timothy 3. Their job is to shepherd the church. The value of the church is that God obtained it with his own blood. So that's the meaning of shepherds. Elders as shepherds. Uh, elder, I think, is fairly straightforward. Somebody who's a little bit older. Obviously, those who have children who have gotten old enough to obey the gospel are older than the, the population average, that makes sense. They bring some uh, experience in life with them by which they can give advice to others who come to them. Yeah, that makes sense. Overseers or supervisors makes sense in the watching, the uh, watching out and watching over, ensuring that things are being done. We can kind of follow that. Shepherd is a much bigger topic, I think, and that's why we've taken two lessons to look at shepherding. These words that are used to describe the office are in fact descriptions not titles you know they're not honorific <laughs> they're a description of the work that is being done so a shepherd has a job to do and for that matter um, 
you know, the Egyptians didn't much care for shepherds because, well, it's hard work and shepherds get smelly. <laughs> so it's good to be apprised of the fact that it's hard work. Be ready to do the work. Be ready to get your hands dirty. Um, in truth, it is hard work. It's going to be, there's going to be trouble. There's going to be problems. There's going to be blood. You think, well, I'm just caring for cattle. Yeah, but there's going to be blood. Uh, the cattle get hurt. You'll get blood on you. There's going to be medicines. There's going to be injections. There's also going to be fences. There's going to be thorns. There's no way for you to get out there and work with barbed wire or razor wire for an entire day, and you're not going to get cut. Yeah, it's going to happen. You're going to get cut. There's going to be blood. That's just how it is. So you're one of the shepherds. You're one of the elders. Yeah. It's going to cost. <laughs> That's true. But it's worth it. It's worth serving God. It's worth the benefit to the church. So consider these things as you look among you. Today, are we speaking and you're not a Christian? Become a Christian that you might have forgiveness of sins. Become a Christian that you might have the protection of God, that you might come under the protection of the good shepherd, the chief shepherd, Jesus, the tutelage through his word, the protection that is afforded through his word, insofar as people believe him, insofar as people obey him. But I hope that this is a place where it would be good for you to obey the gospel, to grow and to learn. We are ready to help you to be buried in baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, that you might become a Christian. But we are ready to pray with you too if you are already a Christian and have not lived right. Repent. Pray God for the forgiveness of the intent of the heart. And let us help you with our prayers too. If you need our prayers and need to obey the gospel, let it be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing.